What's up guys, you're about to watch a new episode of News on China, but I just wanted to put a short video up front to let you know we did experience a bit of technical difficulties. Our connection was cutting in and out, only in a couple of spots. I tried my best to edit it so the flow of the conversation still works well. I think it turned out okay, but uh, just give you a heads up in case you find some of those bits where we cut in and out a bit annoying. Hopefully you still enjoy it, and I will see you in the next video. Enjoy. All right, I think we are recording. Welcome everybody to a new episode. Today is what are we on? We on episode five or episode six? I should have checked that first. This uh, is episode six. 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 Yeah, yes, episode six. Could be more news. Yeah, I think so. And then your your uh, we we skipped a week. Uh, so we're on your side. You're on forty six and forty seven, which is what we're going to look at in a second. But yeah, so welcome everybody to News on China back online. <laughs> so, sorry, I could I couldn't come up with anything better. This was really rushed. It was so okay. we we missed a week, and um, it was re it was really appropriate that during that missing week, I was at uh, Disney Shanghai Disney. We didn't get a chance to meet up while I was in Shanghai, which came directly after mm -hmm. our de de Americanizing uh, Chinese culture. Then then I'm like, all right, Actually, I'm going to go to Disney. That. We didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I should have done it right from Disney. I should have done the live stream from Disney. Right after our de-Americanizing uh, Chinese culture yeah. episode, that would have been good. Exactly, some Mickey Mouse, you know, ears <laughs> yeah. in your head. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. But no, no, it's good to be back. So we're going to go through two videos um, because we we skipped a week, as I as I mentioned. And uh, I, I guess, do you want me to start? I'm just kind of winging it. I didn't even go through the notes here, but do you want me to play the first video then? Go ahead. Yeah, all right. Oh, cool, cool. Let's uh, jump into the first video here, uh, which is your episode 46. All right. Awesome video as always. And uh, from here, what we usually do, if this is your first time joining the show, we'll go in behind the headlines a little bit and uh, go into a little bit more depth. But I just want to say that telescope, because I don't think the telescope one is one that you're going to go into, but that's a really cool story. This is my first time seeing that video too. And uh, I'm so happy about that because space, the topic of space, space travel, I'm a big Trekkie and everything like that. To, to see something like that being open up to the community is amazing. And it's a very different from when when China was left out of the uh, International Space Station, where it was a specific rule that they weren't allowed to collaborate. Um, and there seems to be no animosity from that. They're just saying 10% of the time of the telescope is open for everybody. International space. Love that. Love space. Love that. Story you're going to go into in detail. So how about we just uh, jump right into the ones that you want to talk about? Uh, just just one comment about the about the telescope, which is interesting. Okay. It's very ironic because I mean, not only this is the biggest radio telescope of the world uh, mm -hmm. by far, but the second one, guess what? From from United States, but it's broken. Well, collapsed. Oh. it's not in the United States. It's in Puerto, it's Rico, in Puerto Rico, Rico, actually. The colony of the Puerto Rico. The colony, yeah. But actually collapsed last December. So oh, wow. there's only one big option right now. And there's going to be a lot of uh, actually fight for this 10% of time. Um, yeah. Actually, there's like a, a big line already of, of applications for all around the world. Uh, but yeah. China that's is... Am that's amazing. Yeah. You, you'd imagine some yeah. of the uh, people who were working on the Puerto Rico one uh, before it collapsed. Uh, am I coming through okay, the volume on your side? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, can you... I mean, just... Uh, I mean, we're doing addition, right? Uh, later. Just one thing, because the video was not this one, was the other. 
but maybe we can go to the vaccines. I don't know. Yeah, since we started with the uh, last week's video, we'll start with last week's story. Um, oh, so we're, did I did I did I put them in the wrong order? The the I yeah yeah yeah, the, yeah yeah yeah. What was that? That was that was that was forty six. I played. Yeah oh, yeah. Okay, all right. Because I got forty six and forty seven. So you wanted me to play forty seven first. All right, I'm I'm messed yeah. up. We need we need to yeah I'm I'm fired but <laughs> no but, uh, but before 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 we move on I'm just imagining from the minds of the uh, people at the Puerto Rico site who you know the people who are doing stuff like that they're working on things like that this is probably like their life's work it's their dream it's their you know passion so the the the, the fact that there's it, it, despite there's probably lineups like you said there's a second option out there saying okay I can in some capacity still continue my work is amazing. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, love that story. But let's get into uh, now. I've messed up your whole flow. We'll go right into whatever you need to after the video that I played. All right. So, well, why don't we just play the second video as well? Because let's now we can just play both. Let's just play both videos. People feel yeah, like they yeah. know what's coming up. Okay, cool. All right, let's go right into that video. I'm playing that now. I got it right this time, did I? It's perfect. You pressed the right, right. play button. <laughs> good. <laughs> that was that was a really good video. Also, I, I noticed you you put the picture of the uh, the Xiaomi uh, RV in there. That must have been. <laughs> you must have seen that, and you're like, uh, Daniel's yeah. Daniel's an RV guy. We're gonna. That's an that's yeah. That's an interesting one too. I, from what I understand, they, there's no uh, production date for it yet. It's more just like a way to showcase some of their stuff. But they might eventually make it. But that's that's huge if they, they do. Will. I mean, actually, I mean, by the way, I was thinking, oh, I think Danny will make comments about the EVs, of course. Uh, but actually, it's also a very interesting story. I mean, Xiaomi is it's going to spend like more than 10 billion US dollars in the next years to develop the, the EVs. So they, they are not coming like it's not a joke. They are coming seriously. And right. Yeah, other, yeah, yeah. It's going to be. So like a, but the but the but the the fun to the RV, uh, the, the camper van. That one, yeah. I'm not sure. That's I don't I don't know much about that. I don't know if it's going to be an electric vehicle. But I, when I saw that, it was like it, there's a positive and a negative. One that's positive: the infrastructure for uh, RVing is going to increase around China because if they do yeah. RVs, they're going to do it in a big way. But at, at the same time, there's like kind of like uh, after a certain volume of RVs are on the road, and maybe not everybody might follow the etiquette. Like RVing etiquette is something you got to learn no matter where you are in the world. Also, Okay, I'm, just, I'm worried about that, but uh, it's still, overall, it's going to be, it's going to bring some more infrastructure because right now, RV, there's not many RV parks out there um, to yeah. go and camp out in, and the ones that are there, they're really expensive. So it'll be interesting to see how it uh, develops. But let, let's let's get onto topic on the onto the stories that you wanted to go into into uh, a little bit more depth. Sure thing. So first one, first story of the second video, uh, something we've been waiting for, following for some time, is that the government finds um, Alibaba Group $2.8 billion uh, for their monopolistic practices. It's so a record fine. Record, record fine, fine, absolutely. I mean, that's a huge number. So maybe it goes to say what is, we should say a little bit about what Alibaba Group is. Maybe mm -hmm. it's like more like what, what is it not? <laughs> you know, right? Yeah, that, maybe that's the, that's the better question. <laughs> I mean, it's a Chinese big tech company. You know, the big tech company. It's everything. You know, from online retailers like Taobao, Tmall is theirs as well. Um, it's the China's largest electronic payment system. It's cloud computing. Alipay. Um, yeah, Alipay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. International logistics like China and also EVs. 
uh, electric vehicles yeah. as well. So definitely in, uh, has its fingers in, in many of the They're investing industries. in chips. They're also investing in chips. And so, yeah, absolutely. Right. So it's one of these big, big, big tech companies. So why were they fined? Um, Alibaba was accused of several things. Um, one is these kinds of monopolistic practices like, oh, prohibiting merchants from using other platforms. So if you use Taobao, you use Taobao and that's it. Uh, so you can't pick sides, you have to pick sides. Mm -hmm. uh, but among other things are pretty uh, serious as well as about violating data privacy and also allowing the selling of a lot of counterfeit products. So kind of letting that mm -hmm. slide and on, on it. Yeah. I mean, I remember like recently I was right. trying to, to buy a, a running shoes and, and then I went to Taobao and I was like, Oh, but this is, this is a too cheap for this running shoes. And it's like, what's happening. So I, I went to a friend's like, why is it so cheap? So Marco, you're crazy. You can't buy some stuff in Taobao because they are fake. They are uh, yeah. uh, phony. <laughs> so like, oh, okay, okay. So yeah, yeah. I so mean, they do this a lot. Actually, there's a lot of cases. Yeah, uh, about. absolutely. It, it'll so be interesting to see how much. It'll be interesting to see how much coverage that gets because the fact that there were fake uh, counterfeit products on a uh, Taobao was a very big thing that the, they made a lot of noise about in the West uh, a few years ago. I think it was like five, six years ago. Um, seeing this crackdown, I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of people will never realize that it actually happens. Like 10 years from now, they'll still have that story in the head saying, oh, they were selling counterfeit products on their site this whole time. But it's true. That is a really big problem on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, I mean, the, the, the reeling in of Alibaba is definitely happening. So that figure 2.8 billion is equivalent to 12% of the company's profits for last year. That's a good dent. I mean, they could have actually fined more. Um, according to these new regulations, uh, the Chinese government could have fined up to 10% of its total revenue. So this fine is actually equivalent of only 4%. Uh, and now in addition to this, there's other big tech giants like under the same regulations like JD.com, Tencent, among others that are now given 30 days to sort of correct their practices as well. It'll so, be interesting yeah. to see if, uh, it, it, you know, because one of the other things, I don't know if you, you, I mean, nobody lives in China without noticing this. If you share a Taobao, you can't share Taobao links on uh, on WeChat. Like you can't, you know, you, you've got to, they, they've got to work around where you, they've got to put like the wording of it and then you've got to copy and paste it. But then they started <laughs> yeah. making that even more difficult. After a few days, the, the message will be collapsed. So when you copy it, you don't copy the whole thing. They make it really hard for you to go for you to yeah. go from WeChat to, to uh, Alibaba. Exactly. So and, and the opposite, these... and the yeah, opposite yeah. is true. You can you can buy you can buy. This is the kind of things that uh, now. I mean, according to this new anti-monopoly laws that they've been pushing since last year, this is the kind of things that they are not going to allow anymore. I mean, I think I'm assuming will take a few months uh, until everything goes like into uh, like a new regulations. But right now, I mean, they are all the other companies like, like Ting said, I mean, uh, Tencent, but JD.com, which is also huge, Pinduoduo, uh, many of them, Meituan, all of them, they have now 30 days to rectify themselves and comply to uh, the, the Chinese law. So this is something, I mean, I'm assuming we are going to talk later in, in one month or something like that. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a pretty good, when they see that kind of a, a, a multi-billion dollar fine come out, I think that's a pretty good way to get them moving pretty quickly. So we'll see how that um, yeah. how that goes. Yeah, it, one thing interesting to think uh, from like a broader perspective, a global perspective, is that China is actually, uh, this is a very, I would say, bold uh, step they're doing. It's not easy to deal with <laughs> big tech. They, I mean, they, they basically are running the world, ruling the world. Um, I mean, think about what is Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was interesting is that uh, you don't see this so far happening in, in, in the US. Actually, for instance, at, at last year in December, um, there was a lot of discussion. I mean, it's still going on discussions in European Union because they want to find some of the U.S. big techs because, I mean, I don't know if all of them, but many of them are registered actually in Ireland. <laughs> I don't know if you saw oh, this. Okay. Because it's about all kinds of tricks with algorithms to, I mean, uh, to cheat or not, I mean, cheat people or to make more profits or to get data from people and to um, turn this into more profits. 
So, so European Union wants to find them like heavily, like billions in, in fines. And US, guess what? They were saying, you guys are not going to do that with our companies because our companies are making a lot of money to European Union. So you should not find them. Uh, so this is the kind of debates that it's not only China. This is a global debate right now, but it was interesting is that China is uh, 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 making, uh, is um, what is it called? Sorry. Uh, kind of leading the way. Exactly, you know? leading mm -hmm. the way and 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 giving like the first steps on, on that. So so probably also China will set some sort of precedent. Um, yeah, precedent for that in, in other countries. I mean, yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah. It's interesting to see. I mean, <laughs> when they receive this, um, when they receive this, this, this news about the 2.8 billion, two things happened. Well, one thing is the the, the stocks went up. Yeah, <laughs> stock shares went up by six percent that day. Um, secondly, is that the company said, "Okay, we're not going to appeal. We sincerely accept the punishment." And I think it's actually funny because you remember a few months ago, you know, there was all this like, "Where did Jack Ma go?" Right? Because in October, Jack Ma, the the owner of Alibaba, um, he he had some criticisms or some comments, you know, where he he was talking about the the government wanting to manage the finance sector as like a pawn shop. Um, and then after that, he lay low for a few months and there was the Western media love to say, oh, you know, he's been disappeared, he's been jailed, who knows where he is. You know, he later, I think about three months from November to January, and he reappears one day in January at a, at a live event, recorded event. Um, and he's seen as giving a speech to a rural teachers organized by his charity uh, and also congratulating China's poverty alleviation efforts. You know, obviously the <laughs> he came back. So it's interesting to see. That's like, really, <laughs> that, yeah, that's really weird. Like, I mean, I wonder if there was like some speculation built in that uh, Alibaba was in some big trouble. And then when they realized it was just like, okay, they're going to pay a fine and this problem goes away that all those people who were speculating on the negative side jumped back into the stock and it went and it went back up. Um, I wonder, I wonder if, it, it, I, I mean, I don't know if you've got any other theories as to why it went up when it announced that they had a fine. Yeah, actually, if you see, if you see some of the analysts, um, there was actually uh, two different opinions. Um, some people, some analysts, market analysts like Morgan Stanley, others, they were saying, well, that was actually not a big fine for them. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to hurt uh their uh their company um and also because i mean looks like now they are complying with the government so there's expectation that a sort of a truth like a will, new new confidence uh, right exactly so this this uh but there was also analysts saying that for sure what will happen too is that their profit rates are going to decrease a little bit because some of their profits come from this sort the of monopolistic practices. Yeah, MLS, exactly. So also, I wouldn't say. I mean, the the markets are like one day after two days. Yeah. It's it's yeah. always yeah. like okay, let's wait next six months. Let's let's yeah. one year to see what happens. But but you you said something interesting where it's like almost like the fine is almost like a certificate of compliance. Like because obviously yeah. by the time that fine came out. You, you know they've gone through the company like crazy and they know that, okay, Alibaba is going to be compliant now. They paid this fine and we don't have to speculate anymore about whether this company is in trouble or it's going to be taken down or something like that. So, yeah, it kind of makes yeah. sense. It kind of makes sense when you think yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's uh, one more thing about that interesting is that, well, the same group, Alibaba, Jack Ma, uh, Ma Yun, uh, mm -hmm. has another uh, also big issue regarding specifically to Ant Group. Who is the finance and financial arm, yeah. Uh, yeah, financial what's alipay mm -hmm. uh actually this is like a big story also it coming from last year you remember that they were supposed to have the biggest ipo in the mm -hmm. history of yep. capitalism it would be something like 35 to 37 us uh, uh billion uh dollars so and it was suspended a bit after this comments that this criticism that that uh, Jackie Ma went uh, did to the government to the finance regulations, but actually since then the government is um, uh, rectifying and is in conversations and uh, with Ant Group because there's a one problem happening with Ant Group. It's not only them actually. All the big techs does that is that they actually they are becoming banks in practice. 
-hmm. what they do because they have uh, Alipay, for instance, have more than 730 million users. So mm -hmm. they have a lot of data and they know, they track, of course, your uh, consumption is that they became mediators between banks and people wanting like small, small, loans. small loans, like and fast, like I need like 5,000 right now. You just go to the Alipay and you get. But guess what? The government say, no, no, guys, wait, you cannot do that. You are an e-payment platform. You are not a bank. And at some point that in the last year, most of the profits of Ant Group came from this practice of micro lending, not from Alipay, not from e-payment. Almost like 40% of their profits is coming from, from this, uh, this practice. So that was actually the, the fight. That was actually because uh, mm -hmm. what, what Jack Ma criticized and say, oh, you guys, there's finance regulations. So the government say, I'm sorry, the banks, they have to comply with certain rules. Otherwise, we're going to create. It's actually a, a, a market without regulations. And we know by experience what happened, for instance, 2008 in the U.S. was the financial crisis has also to do with, with like the, the low regulations of finance um, market. So yeah, right now, in regards to loans, yeah, exactly. So 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 right now, that's the the big issue. We still don't know the the final results. It's probably going to be a talk. Uh, Didi, the 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 tax uh, uh, app, they do the same because all of them they have a lot of data from people. So what they claim is that they are very good in assess the risks of a client. So they sell this to the bank. So say, okay, things she can pay. Or oh, Marco, mm, I'm not so sure. So that's the kind of things that they do. But everybody does that. JD does that. DD does that. Mitch does, does that. Uber does that. Uber does that. <laughs> it's not just Chinese companies. So it's actually, it's uh, at the end of the day, that's that's a big tech is a big problem because they have a lot of power with data. They can do many things with data. And the government, the states are still not prepare they, for that they aren't able to regulate them exactly it's very new fall under the classifications so i think this again this is something that also i think for for uh, uh for an audience that i mean this is a big thing i think in china is that so this also has to do with the the way the china uh politics uh works right i mean this is capitalist classes here they have to comply yeah and and this yeah, is what's yeah. happening right now. It's it's almost like I mean uh, for a lot of stuff, losing. You know what? Hold on, one second. Let me change my Wi-Fi. One second. Mm -hmm. Give me one second. Yeah, we were losing you. Yeah. Okay, I think that should be that should be a little bit better. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So, um, I, I, one of the advantages that China has is that they, you know, the West has had a head start in a lot of their stuff, you know, with their Facebooks and Googles and stuff like that, and they can look at what are the biggest problems over there, and yeah. the concerns of data privacy, and also the ability for private uh, companies to manipulate people too. If you look at some of those kinds of, um, uh, what was the? I can't remember the campaign that that basically manipulated people before elections and things like that in the U.S. Brexit, um, Trump. Brazil. Yeah, you know there there was. Uh, go, uh, yeah, no, no, there Cambridge was. Uh, I, I want to Cambridge say, Analytica. The, the yes, company that's who, it. That's it. That's it. Cambridge Analytica and stuff like that. Like big data is right now. They put this much. Uh, they 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 give this much power to these companies. I, I'm I'm keep losing my connection a little bit here. So how about you guys yeah. continue talking about whatever your next uh, your next story is. Okay, sure thing. So story number two um, is about China-Middle East relations. So at the end of March, Wang Yi, Foreign Minister Wang Yi, went to Middle East towards six countries, uh, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Iran, uh, UAE, Bahrain, and Oman. So it's kind of in the lead up of the, the summit, the, the Arab-China summit that will happen later this year. But one of the big things that came out of it is a really pretty historic deal that was struck between uh, China and Iran. What, what was it? It was a 25-year strategic cooperation deal. Um, mm -hmm. And um, but while there's still a lot of details that aren't yet disclosed, more or less, it's, it looks like it could be up to an investment, a Chinese investment of $400 billion. Here. 
for infrastructure for oil uh, trade uh, uh, agreement. So Iranian oil for Chinese investment and technology for infrastructure. Um, and this is also coming at the heels of you know extreme sanctions that that both countries are facing, but particularly hit hard as Iran over the last I guess decade or more now. Decade, yeah. Um, you know, just to give a sense, like this is coming in the context of between 2014 and 2020, uh, the bilateral trade between Iran and China because of the U.S. sanctions had already fallen uh, from 52 billion to 20 billion. So it had more than halved during the last six years. Um, and so, you know, obviously Iran is in a, a very desperate situation to to be able to receive investments, do trade and, and have a, a partner that can cooperate with. Um, and so right. in some ways, um, we're seeing that uh, there's a kind of pushing together of these yeah. allies because of your sanctions. Yeah, I mean, the yeah, same, the same as, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it, it, there, there's a lot of enemies of the West that have been left behind that are just desperate for another option. Um, you know, obviously, Iran is one of the countries that had their government overthrown uh, by the U.S. also. Um, and... Uh, you know, the people were, I, I talk about this a lot. There's a lot of places and sometimes less obvious places too, uh, that have just been desperate for other options. And I mean, imagine for the, the ordinary people there who have been suffering from these sanctions, um, whose government f uh, followed the JC, uh, JCPOA, JCOPA deal. Uh, I can't remember the exact abbreviation. J yeah. Yeah. The JC JCOA, I guess. Yeah. yeah. JCPOA. JCPOA. Um, yeah. They followed it. They they were saying, okay, yeah, and, you know, they were letting people in for inspections and stuff like that. And then just suddenly uh, the U.S. said, nah, we don't want to follow it anymore. And it's not like when uh, Biden came back in, they were just going to resume it and say, okay, no, that was wrong. We broke our promise. Um, they wanted to add all sorts of new conditions in place that had nothing to do with the original deal saying, okay, like mm -hmm. it, they, they used it as a chance to renegotiate. At some point, you, you know, people are going to realize it's just too dangerous uh, to deal with the U.S. for a lot of countries. So this is, hopefully they're not going to do any of the same stuff. I don't think they are, but um, it's probably uh, it's about time. There's some additional options on the table. But sorry, you were you were you were going to say? I, I might, no, you, I might uh, you might lose me uh, uh, in and out. I'm just trying to find the best network to go on. But you can continue talking as we uh, as we go. You want to stop? Well, we, we can. Uh, we okay, can stop give me one want. second. Let me change. Let me yeah, change yeah. one worry, one more. Yeah. I think my connection is going to be good now. Can you hear me pretty clearly now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's actually okay, mostly good. very All good. Right, let's, let's go. So just suddenly, okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> so actually, I mean, it's the same. Again, we were talking uh, like a few weeks ago about about Russia. I mean, it's it's a very similar case. I mean, by the way, you saw this week, U.S. just slapped like very very heavy sanctions against Russia again. It's actually the worst ones in the last years. So, so Iran is the same case. I mean, of course, it's even worse because it it's like a one, one ten years already. Uh, the economy is really uh, um, is devastated. Actually, the economy of Iran right now is and and the needs for infrastructure, for ports, for roads, for railways, um, all of that, factories. They they need that and and they can do it. I mean, imagine, for instance, like the the famous case of uh, uh, Wang Wang Wangzhou, the Meng uh, Meng Wangzhou, Meng Wangzhou, Meng, Meng Wangzhou. Uh, yeah, it's it's. I mean, yeah. she's now arrested in Canada, and and U.S. wants to extradite her to the U.S. because of Iran. So that that's the level of of the of how much U.S. is hurting many countries like China, Russia, Iran, 30% of the countries, as we said, has some sort of sanctions from, from U.S. You, you, you imagine, like, uh, you honestly imagine how uh, scary it must be for some of these countries as well um, when they know that they are um, there. Sorry, can you, can you hear me? I, yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, sorry, sorry, connect, connection is coming in and out here, yeah. But yeah, no, you imagine how scary it is for some of these countries. And I think a lot of the times the U.S. makes it clear to them when they have these meetings with them. Like if you read anything about the people who are kind of like, you know, for example, the economic hit man and stuff like that, you realize how they go in and they try to send a clear message. Say, so you don't mess with us. I, I just shared on my last video, which I recorded this morning. I haven't uploaded it yet. I posted it yet. Um, I, I, I played a clip of uh, John Mearsheimer talking to Australians saying, you know, who, who, who you're. You heard up Can until you, hear me? you said you uploaded something. 
Yeah. Okay. Oh, that was quite a while. Okay. Sorry, guys. Uh, hopefully, my connection is <laughs> shorting out now. But okay. Yeah. Sorry. So I I was saying that in 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 I uploaded a video this morning that I recorded. I haven't posted it yet, but uh, I, I showed John Mearsheimer talking to an Australian audience about how they have two choices: they could go with the U.S. or they could go with China. But if you start trading too much with China, if you start getting too close to China, then you're our enemy, and we're going to get angry. And you don't want to get us get us mangry, angry. You. Uh, you, you know, you, you don't underestimate how nasty we can get. He says, just ask Fidel Castro. And and it's like, like this is like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the audience, wow, the Australian audience was laughing. The Australian audience was laughing like, ha, 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 ha. It's like, no, he's serious. <laughs> it's like, these are serious, serious bullies. Uh, and it's so unfortunate. You would have thought that this would have put all of this stuff where it's like, oh, crap, you know what? Um, for some reason, we don't know why, it's, it seems like it's easier for China to make friends around the world. M maybe it has something to do with them not overthrowing their governments and uh, funding coups in their country. I, I don't know, but it's a strange thing going on. And you would think on what I was hoping, and I've said this many times, is that it, they would have used it as an opportunity to then start to come to the table with some better options and just say, hey, listen, guys, you know, we had a good run as the only global superpower that could do almost anything we wanted, where, whenever we wanted, wherever we wanted. But now we've got to actually compete. So let's come up with some better options than the Belt and Road Initiative. But what you're seeing is there's a new proposal in Congress uh, to fund uh, USAGM $200 million per year uh, to basically up the uh, uh, anti-China pro uh, propaganda campaign and even specifically against the Belt and Road Initiative. So they're not going to you imagine $200 million a year for a period of like seven years or something like that. You imagine if they put that into creating a better option than the Belt and Road Initiative then. But no, they want to use that money to pull the rug out from underneath uh, China's feet. It's it's really it's really there's a lot to be sad about uh, over that. But um, yes. yeah, and this is just I mean, one one of those things that yeah. Go ahead. No, I mean it's like you brought that example. I mean it's exactly it. I mean even you had mentioned earlier uh, in, in Rand's own history, you know, and, and the run-ins with the U.S. But there's a, another moment I think in the early '50s. You know, it's talking about how U.S. tries to control uh, governments over oil. Like there was a democratically elected uh, prime minister, Mossadegh, who was in the early 50s. It was over yeah. oil. You know, they, at that point, their oil was being controlled by uh, uh, BP. Uh, British. Yeah, BP, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, they wanted to kick them out and nationalize the oil. And guess what the U.S. does? You know, it, CIA with the right wing forces organizes a uh, coup and overthrows him, you know? So, I mean, this is, they don't even have to go to ask Fidel. They can just ask their own history, you know, very easily and knows what it is. And on the other hand, now there's China giving another option through, you know, you're talking about the BRI, but China also needs a secure source of oil, right? Like that, that's in their interest. And it's in the yeah. interest of a, a country really strangled by sanctions that they need to develop their, their um, economy and infrastructure. And also a big part of this too, is like it's facilitating trade, but it's we know that there are these strategic chokeholds that China is also afraid of, you know, whether it's like the Straits of Malacca or the Suez Canal um, that the U.S. can really take advantage of to cut off oil supplies to China. You know, we saw, I mean, it's unrelated to that, but but like, you know, if you, the debacle with the Suez Canal being blocked for a few days. You know, that canal itself has million barrels of oil a day, 12% of global trade, and that blockage costs billions of billions dollars, of dollars yeah. you know, that's so I'm just saying like Iran is totally strategic for China because they need to secure their, their oil interest, but in terms that Iran wants to agree to. So there's two actually um, among many projects of the BRI that's around that, right? They're trying to create overland routes. Uh, mm -hmm. Not just by sea, because it's it, you know it's uh, more more vulnerable. Is that so? Iran is strategic in connecting Central Asia, Turkey, Balkans, Eastern Europe with China. So, and there's also other pipelines that they're trying to develop in the Caspian Sea, connecting actually through through Kazakhstan to Xinjiang into China. So that that is a you know oil is a key uh, strategic you know it's the same with Russia also yeah, that's absolutely. why Russia is so important to them because right. they can they can bring oil they can bring gas uh, through the the hinterland the so called the hinterland and, and not the yeah not the so a, a lot of the, a lot of the times when um, the U S is going in and controlling these oil supplies like they are now in um, Syria also with the uh, 
with the U.S. backed Kurd forces, which are controlling the oil and uh, supplying it to the U.S. A lot of the times it's not about the U.S. getting the oil themselves. It's about being able to strangle off whatever economies they want to, just controlling the supply, being able to cut off a country when they want. Um, so, it, you know, through specific uh, ocean routes and stuff like that, maybe it's a little bit easier to control. But when when China's all of a sudden going over land and they're opening up all of these pathways that are going to be harder to strangle off, you can start to understand why uh, the U.S. is panicking in terms of, you know, the guys in charge of the uh, uh, the Imperial America kind of practices. Absolutely. Exactly. So, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, this visit from from uh, Wang Yi was was really important um, because actually what China has been doing uh, lately, also in mid Middle East, is is to becoming a, a real protagonist and mediating all the that even the tensions in the region. I mean, imagine that when we met one day the Iranians and the other day the Saudis. I mean, who else? I mean, there's not may, maybe the Russians can do that easily because also the Russians has this role. They they talk to everybody. Everybody respect them because they follow the agreements. This is mm. something that uh, Lavrov is, is being saying, the foreign minister of Russia said, the problem of U.S. is that they are incapable to sustain or to keep an agreement. Yeah. And they, I mean, we, we do something here. We agree with something here. Like three months after that, they just break the rules. So no, this is true. what China yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, like, it, you know, they always talk about a rules-based world. They always use this <laughs> world, a rules-based world. What what rules? The rules that you can change whenever you want. And it's <laughs> it's perfect when you have a two-party system where you can keep shifting accountability from one side to the other. It's like, oh, well, no, that was Trump who broke the JCO, JCOPA deal, JCPOA deal. Um, and then when Biden comes in, well, no, they're not restoring it. They're saying, well, no, we're going to use this as an opportunity to renegotiate now anyways, you know, and they get these little steps when you go back and forth like a yo-yo. The only advantage is that you have a way to shift blame, uh, basically. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you know that I mean, I was remember the uh, Putin, he said like uh, maybe a couple of years ago, he said, you know what? Negotiate with the U.S. sometimes is like playing chess with the pigeon. <laughs> you playing, but then suddenly they come into the the chessboard. They um, what is it called? They overthrow the pieces. <laughs> they pull in the chessboard and they just turn it yeah, back yeah, and they, yeah. they they go out. It's like how can you do with these people? It's like playing chess with a pigeon. So this yeah. is what Putin said, and he knows a lot. It's twenty years <laughs> dealing with the. Uh, with when, the when, when you actually yeah. listen to some of his um, analysis of how the U.S. political system works. Um, it's actually really interesting. Like, I mean, even when he was talking about Obama, he's like, you know, Obama's not a bad guy. You know, when Obama made the promise that he was going to close Guantanamo Bay, he he really believed it. He really thought that he was going to come in and, and 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 do that. But then after he gets in, somebody sits him down. You know, he says some people in some suits come and sit him down and say, "All right, listen, this is this is how things work." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So at the end of the day, that's that's the, the the bottom line is that China is 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 more and more playing an important political role also in in the Middle East and also because of of course of trade. For instance, right now, uh, Saudi Arabia is the biggest oil supplier of China. We mentioned that when we're talking about Russia because Russia is number two. Um, so the same with uh, Iraq, right? Mm -hmm, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting because Iraq kind of. Um, uh, experience a huge surge in their exports to China because of some of these sanctions that were happening, um, especially against Venezuela and Iran. So it was able to export more to China. So it was number three last year and increased like something almost 20% uh, year on year for their exports to China. But, you know, it's, you know, now those exports are to China are a third or more than a third of Iraq's total exports is just oil to China. Yeah. But again, of course, these are places that have oil. And, you know, we know how when we're asking the question, well, how does U.S. get oil out of places? We were talking about Iran. Well, in Iraq, it's like bombing the hell. You know, it's uh, two wars, uh, what, at least 600,000 deaths. Um, 200,000 kids. Yeah. You know, and millions of people displaced. So, you know, I know you did yeah. a video recently. We we're talking about Syria. I mean, the devastation there and Trump saying, oh, we're pulling out our troops. But we're staying for the oil. 
we're protecting the oil, just the troops enough to keep the yeah. oil. I mean, it's that like, so, so. I mean, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. You know, it, with Iraq, it's a good example, too, because it's not only a matter of uh, the U.S. having terms, you know, with a friendly country um, that's actually not doing anything wrong. And you, they can, you can suddenly change. And, you know, Iraq is an example of supporting somebody who is brutal. I mean, Saddam Hussein was a brutal person, but he was buddy buddy with the U.S. He was, you know, they were friends. They were friends. And it, it really is like a mafia when all of a sudden somebody from the inside, one of your own guys, you take them out once you're ready. You knew he was brutal all along. It has nothing to do with that. But um, I just really hope we see some change in regards to this. Um, and, and that's what I, I hope when we see this kind of uh, growth, different ways of approaching international relationships, that maybe there's a hope of that if, um, if, uh, if, the, if, if the U.S.'s campaigns don't work um, as they intend to just, like I said, pull the rug out from underneath their feet. I mean, that's one of the things. I mean, with China, like what Marco was saying about uh, playing a, there's a possibility of it playing a bigger role or a kind of alternative to the way that U.S. has really dominated this region, right? I mean, the multilateral approach, it's also a way for these countries to be able to defend a little bit of the kind of onslaught that they've experienced of U.S. interest in the region in many senses. So it's one possibility of strengthening that. But it's also another thing, like we're talking about exports, like a lot of these countries don't just want to be an exporter of crude oil. <laughs> Or developing like rail lines like this this is for the possibility for industrializing too i mean that that's not just about who to yeah. export to who's a better you know importer of oil or something like that so yeah, yeah, yeah. we look look to that and Absolutely. hope that there is a kind of alternative you know you know it's it's really interesting we we started this show out in the beginning where we did, didn't want to mention the u.s at all we were going to try to stay away from that but you know what it, it's really hard because this that's the biggest challenge that china's up against you can't talk about china without talking about the u.s because this is the force that really wants to undermine everything they do um so it's really it's impossible to get away from it but maybe we i, I think we've got another story uh you've got another story maybe that's not u.s related i'm, I'm sure we might slip back into talking about them but what, what's the next story well, a little bit, maybe. It's about vaccines, of course. This is oh, now we we got to talk right about now. the U.S. then with that one. There's no way to. There's no way to. You know, exactly. they they have they have what is it? Twenty million AstraZeneca uh, vaccines in the U.S. which aren't being used. They're not giving it to their own yep. population. Canada wants it. They've ordered it, and they're say, they're not releasing it to them. And there was the thing on CTV. They're like, what's going on? This doesn't even make any sense. This could save millions of lives. You're not even using it. You haven't even approved it yet. It's almost going to expire, you know. So we, yeah. By, by the way, I don't know if you saw this, but but uh, a couple of days before Biden announced, uh, Lula gave um, President, ex President Lula from Brazil, he gave an interview to CNN, and one of the things he said, by President Biden, please, we know you have millions of vaccines that you're not using. Please send this to the poor countries." Send this to Africa and send this to Mexico. <laughs> it was like a couple of days before Biden announced, "Oh, yeah, I'm going to send to Mexico and Canada." I mean, now that Canada is it's it's needing, right? Canada has like yeah, but a, they they paid for it. Yeah, they 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 pay they pay like they're a paying customer. They paid for it and they can't even get it. They're just like, "No, we're going to keep it here for now." Yeah, yeah. So, but but I mean, again, I mean, I'm sorry. That's facts. What's happening with China regarding that? So mm -hmm. basically, China exported so far half of its production, half of what was produ produced in, in, in China uh, is 115 um, million doses. That's exported? It was exported. Mm -hmm. So but it was 230 million was produced. This is like uh, from last week. Uh, 230 million doses were produced. And Exactly for I mean basically for global south countries of course it was actually thirty seven countries got donations from China thirty seven countries and it's, I think it's, now is yeah. even more already yeah it's probably worth mentioning too that China is uh, one of the countries that supports the idea of put, putting a patent waiver in place for the vaccines where they just want to make it open source so uh, more people can produce it and uh, U S is opposed to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah they they and i mean they already uh 
um, had agreements with 70 countries. But for instance, even even this, what you're mentioning, with it's it's happening in Brazil. There is an agreement with a, a Brazilian lab from the state of São Paulo. It's called Butantan. Uh, that will start producing. I mean, they're transferring technology. So they will they will produce the vaccines in a few months. Uh, I mean, in Brazil already with with uh, with the, the technology. So this is what's, and that's, what's happening. That's China, that's China exporting that technology to them, giving them that technology. Yeah, uh, yeah the Sinovac. That's the yep. that's the uh, the Chinese vaccine. That's actually, I mean, uh, President Lula just got the second doses a few days ago uh, from the. Sinovac and AstraZeneca, but so far uh, more Sinovac. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. no, it's. I mean, we. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like last year, like we were talking about just the donations, right? Like it's important to kind of know who are some of the countries that get donations. Like yeah. it's countries like Venezuela. We've mentioned this before, right? Uh, there's 500,000 doses that have been sent to Venezuela because we know that the sanctions isn't just the economic thing. It's, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, med medicine, essential medicine and equipment is actually blocked. So to send 500,000 doses to Venezuela in this moment um, is essential or 100,000 to Palestine. Uh, I think there's 200,000 to various, you know, like Zimbabwe, small, small, smaller countries in Africa or Republic of Guinea. So places that absolutely need them. Of course, a lot of this, like the details of, you know, the 115 million um, doses, how many of them were donated, like th those details aren't yet fully clear. Um, but the main exporters or commitments to export have been really China and Russia. Yeah. Um, like combined, not only have they been hoarding vaccines they can't even use, like we mentioned, but, you know, they've been buying up all the vaccines. Like the there was a study a few months ago from People's Vaccine Alliance. Um, you know, overall, in total, the rich countries have bought three times worth of vaccines in their population. Canada is even more absurd. It's five times. Like, why does a country of 35 million need five times its vaccines? You know, and then the places that are actually producing, like UK and elsewhere, like, they haven't exported anything, you know? Zero. Imagine <laughs> UK... They have their own vaccine, AstraZeneca, uh, together with uh, Sweden, and they have exported zero. I mean, yeah. it's not a poor country. UK is not a poor country that, oh, we can because we don't have resources. Come on. I mean, Russia is doing a lot, is, is donating a lot. China is donating a lot. I mean, right now, Cuba. Cuba is already de developing more than one, actually. There's already two they are going to donate to many African countries, Latin American countries. Of course, they will also sell because they need, right. by the way, because also the sanctions of U.S. in the like 60 yeah. years, the economy is also uh, like not in a good shape, but but they are doing. So so this is something that it's we can't understand how, how, how is it possible that at this point, I mean, millions of people dying, I mean, there are African countries that expect to vaccinate its population in 2024 because they don't have access. Right. They don't have money. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, yeah, it's remarkable that when you, the few times you hear uh, the U.S. mainstream media companies, uh, 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 outlets talking about the donations from China, it's always uh, or frequently called vaccine diplomacy. Like, it's like they're even trying to like slander the effort saying it's like, mm -hmm. I don't care what you want to call it. Maybe you should do some of it too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, it would like, be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a group of diasporic Chinese people, and they put out just on this, you know, kind of like inversing this, you know, vaccine diplomacy to vaccine internationalism. You know, so a lot of this stuff right. actually is in there, and you can actually see the yeah, information. For, for the ones who doesn't know how do you spell, Chow? Uh, Q I A O. It means like I guess bridge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They just yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they have very good stuff actually about China. I mean, we strongly recommend that you guys also follow their, their things, yeah, Twitter sure. and, and website, and very good. Uh, but I mean, for instance, just one example about countries who are, are getting uh vaccine, uh, donations of vaccines uh uh from, from China. Uh Zimbabwe, Guinea, guy, what you say, Guinea, mm -hmm. they got two hundred thousand vaccines. Uh, yeah, like some of the ones I just named as well, you know, Palestine, Venezuela, yeah. many, many countries. Seychelles uh, vaccinating population, yeah. which is an island country in Africa. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's 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 amazing to see the effort. Um, yeah, my apologies. I keep cutting in and out, so hopefully the connection's been okay. But um, I think that was your that was your last story, right? Was about the vaccine. Yeah, I just want just uh, in like a more personal note. I just sure, yeah. wanted to say that I mean I'm getting first jab on of of uh, vaccine on Monday in China. Nice being a foreigner, nice. being a foreigner, and, and I mean this is this is a big deal. I mean. I mean, there's so many people in my country right now. They just don't have access. To the situation, the government, we know, didn't take any precautions, any measures. And plus, we don't have access, enough access to vaccine. So being here as a Brazilian in China right now and have access to vaccine, it's it's like, uh, I mean, I should be very grateful for that. So yeah, no, that's amazing. I I was looking at uh, we we can get it in Shenzhen now. Also, I have a, a foreign friend, an Australian friend, who got his uh, two days ago. Uh, I'm going to be traveling soon, and I'm going to be traveling to places where I'll be meeting up with people where we're going to be drinking. And it says if you uh, do the the the, the vaccine, yeah. you can't drink for a week or something like that. And I was like, oh, I got I got to schedule don't, it between. Uh, don't remind me of that. Don't remind me of that. <laughs> I mean, I think maybe just to leave it on this note. I mean, at the poor note of not drinking, but I mean, it's a big question, right? Like, it's actually like a global question. How do you vaccinate a, a world of like nearly eight billion people? Yeah. Um, and 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 one of the things that because we're both researchers of Tricontinental, a short short a publication just got launched called the People's Vaccine, like trying to think about what would be a people's vaccine, what would it look like? Because it's various aspects, not just the vaccine. How do you get it to the people? It's like okay, it right. actually talks about you need robust public health systems. You need to actually defend and build up, you know, public health systems that have been really cut back in most countries like by neoliberal policies and, you know, decades of this stuff, like we're seeing them being tested in the last period of the COVID, of COVID virus. But then there's also other things like, how do you get vaccines from place A to place place B? Yeah. Like we've covered some stories about, you know, all these like cold chains, uh, you know, how to get like the the airplane routes that I can, can, can actually, um, uh, you know, transport vaccines at the temperature needed to survive. So there's been huge chain in Ethiopia to supply Africa and also, um, in Europe and other Middle Eastern um, region, but also like, how do you monitor it afterwards? Like all this stuff we're talking about, like, um, like the vaccine passport mm -hmm. or these monitoring systems that have been built here, like, are absolutely essential to share with other place regions so that they yep. can they can figure out how the tracking can work afterwards. Because and, and maybe your viewers would be interested in that too. This is called the People's Vaccine, and kind of a call for thinking about. Uh, a more, I guess, like a more just way of 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 like thinking about health in this moment. It's absolutely critical. Vaccines is the most essential. So is thing that is that something you have a, a link to, where there's a, an article or a discussion about that? You have a link that okay, we'll put we'll put that in the description. And um, Super, I agree. That's great. That's, Perfect. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good uh, note to leave uh, leave on. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be traveling a bit, so maybe our next episode will be uh, on the road. Um, or I'll be in, in Shanghai for a couple of days too. So maybe we'll we'll meet up when I'm uh, up there. So absolutely, let's yeah. do it. <laughs> but, but when I'm up, when I'm up there, you can't, you can't drink, can you? Yeah, you're not. Yeah, we. Oh no! Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to resolve this offline. Vaccine or? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> All right, well, let's leave it on that. No, we'll, yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll figure it out after this. But yeah, thanks again. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. And uh, we will catch you in the next episode. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.